that our hearts will arise to your presence and ever as King of Glory will be in a better position to serve you to the glory of your name. Speak to our heart, speak to our mind, speak to every part of us that you may revive it to serve you better. In Jesus' name we do pray and give thanks. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Let's appreciate Brother Mark. And let's, let's appreciate Lisa with a big hand clap to the Lord. Okay. We look at the passage of scripture and we have two passages right here. So get to Second Kings chapter 7. We read this passage together, then we'll explore the word together. Uh, Second Kings 7. Um, and I read Second Kings 7. Um, now we find this account. Then Elijah said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow, about this time, a seer of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel, and two seers of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. So an officer on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And he said, In fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but shall not eat of it. Now there were four leprous men. Tell your neighbor, four leprous men. Tell them, four leprous men. At the entrance of the gate, and they said to one another, Why are we sitting here until we die? If we say, we will enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if, if we sit here, we die also. Now therefore, come, let us surrender to the army of the Assyrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall only die. And they rose at twilight to go to the camp. Tell your neighbor, arose. They rose. They rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and noise of horses. Tell your neighbor, the Lord had caused. Now look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Egyptians to attack us. Therefore, they arose and fled at twilight and left the camp intact, their tents, their horses, and their donkeys. And they fled for their lives. And when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into one tent and ate and drank and carried from it silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. Then they came back and entered another tent and carried some from there also and went and hid it. Then they said to one another, We are not doing right. I pray our politicians would say this. I can I hear an amen? This day is a day of good news. And we remain silent. If we wait until morning, until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now therefore come, let us go and tell the king's household. So they went and called to the gatekeepers of the city and told them, saying, we, we went to the Syrian camp, and surprisingly no one was there. Not a human sound, only horses and donkeys tied, and the tents intact. And the gatekeepers called out and told it to the king's household inside. So the king arose, tell your neighbor, the king arose. In the night and said to his servants, let me now tell you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we are hungry. Therefore they have gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, when they come out of the city, we shall catch them alive and get into, sit, into the city. And one of his servants answered and said, Please, let several men take five of the remaining horses which are left in the city. Look, they may either become like all the multitude of Israel that are left in it, or indeed, I say, they may become like all the multitude of Israel, left from those who are consumed, so let us send them and see. And the scripture tells us, therefore, they took two chariots with the horses, and the king sent them in the direction of the Syrian army, saying, Go and see. And they went after them to Jordan, 
to the Jordan. And indeed, all the road was full of garments and weapons, which the Syrians had thrown away in their haste. So the messengers returned and told the king. Then the people went out and plundered the tents. Tell your neighbor, plundered the tents of the Syrians. So a seer of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two seers of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. Now tell them, according to the word of the Lord. Now the king had appointed the officer on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate, but the people trampled him in the gate, and he died, just as the man of God had said, who spoke when the king came down to him. So it happened, just as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, Two seers of barley for a shekel and a seer of fine flour for a shekel shall be sold tomorrow about this time in the gate of Samaria. Then that officer had answered the man of God and said, Now look, if the Lord would make a window, would make windows in heaven, could such a thing be? And he said, In fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Tell your neighbor, there are people who see with their eyes. But they never possess it. I tell your neighbor, and I'm not one of them. I tell your neighbor, there are people who see with their eyes. But they never possess it. And I'm not one of them. And so it happened to him, for the people trampled him in the gate, and he died. One more passage. So we break down scripture. We go to Genesis 27, verses 30. It's nice to engage in the word and hear what the Lord is telling us. Genesis 27, 30. We take a few times, just a few verses. Now it happened as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. He also had made savory food and brought it to his father and said to his father, Let my father arise, tell a neighbor, arise, and eat of his son's game, that your soul may bless me. And his father Isaac said to him, Who are you? So he said, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, Who, where is the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came. And I have blessed him, and indeed he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceeding great and bitter cry, and said to his father, Bless me, bless me also, O my father. But he said, Your brother came with deceit, and has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and now look, he has taken away my blessing. And he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Then Isaac answered and said to Esau, Indeed, I have made him your master. And all his brethren I have given to him as servants. With grain and wine I have sustained him. What shall I do now for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me, me also, O my father. And Esau lifted back his voice and wept. Then Isaac his father answered and said to him, Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth, and of the dew of heaven from above. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. Now I want us to say this together, and it shall come to pass. Let's say it loudly, and it shall come to pass. One more time, and it shall come to pass. When you become restless, that you shall break his yoke from your neck. Our Heavenly Father, we take time to meditate on the scripture because your word speaks to your people better than any sermon. But tonight, as we dig deeper on your call to us to arise, may you raise us up from wherever we are. Lord, you know your people. You know where they are at. You know the pain they may be in and the challenges they may be having. But tonight is a night, it's a different kind of night. This is a night when you raise your people to levels they never imagined. Because you are Jehovah God. You are a God of miracles. You are a God of wonders. 
You're a God of mighty deeds. You're a God of the impossible. You're the God who does what no one can do. You're the God who is present here. You're the God who is speaking now. You're the God among your people. You're the God who is arising and touching your people at their point of need. Speak to us, Lord, in Jesus' name. What do you do when life deals you a bad hand? What do you do when life deals you a bad hand? And you feel so disadvantaged in comparison to other people. Actually, maybe the question is, has life ever dealt you a bad hand? Has it ever dealt you a bad hand? And you looked and said, everyone else seems to be advantaged except me. Everyone else seems seems to be in a better position than me. Everyone else seems to be getting open doors except me. Have you ever found yourself and said, life has dealt me a bad hand? I was reading the Standard newspaper the other day, 21st of August. And Kenya was rated among 126 countries. And the, in the rule of law, out of 126 countries, Kenya was 101. They were saying we have terror gangs, corrupt justice, and government systems, and serious bribery. And suddenly, you can imagine how it feels. Out of 126, we are one. Or one. Now, we are used to being number one in athletics. Hallelujah. When we do the marathons, we are number one. But suddenly, on integrity, we are not scoring very well. July 9th, 2017, I read an article about the labor productivity index of Kenyans. On a scale of 1 to 10, we scored 2.2 out of 10. 2.2 productivity index, imagine. For us to be what we want to be in 2030, we need to have 4.0 productivity index. But we are doing what? Two dots? And yet we are the ones leading in East and Central Africa. So what, what is the index of other countries in this region? If we are scoring two dots, two. Japan has a 7.6 productivity index. No wonder it's the third, it's the third most powerful economy in the world. They are very productive. How come, I've been asking myself, Justice is dispensed at high speed for petty offenders. The chicken thief, chicken thieves, their justice is dealt with so quickly, you don't even, you wonder how quickly the magistrates make the decision. Have you ever noticed? The chicken thief, the avocado thief, you know, when they are caught. Those guys, they know there is justice in this country. All right? But when someone takes billions of shillings, we hear of something called anticipatory bail. And the justice system doesn't just work. I was asking myself, how come for the small and medium enterprise business people, you bring in a consignment from China, you cannot bring a whole ship or a whole container, you can only bring a consolidation, isn't it? But it it is stuck at the port or at the ICD for one year. One whole year. So you're borrowing money, you're having overdrafts, because... It is stuck. Yet, we all know some other things come through the country without any challenge. And suddenly we start asking ourselves, have we been dealt a bad hand? Have we been dealt a bad hand? Are we, are we on the wrong side? And that's at a national level. Some people are very lucky. Some people are not as lucky. In fact, I was telling someone about if people were to be described that, or that some people are born with a silver spoon in their mouth and everything seems to work for them. So somebody told me it's like they're born on top of the tree and so they can just eat the fruit thereof. And some are born just at the branches. You know, they just have to stretch their hand and get the fruit. Some are born at the foot of the tree. All they have to do is climb the tree, but some of us were born beneath the tree. So we have to We have to work so hard to get to the surface and we get very excited. We say, aha, this is how it looks like. Because we we all are not born with the same opportunities. And sometimes we may feel that we've been dealt a bad hand. When I was in school, in primary school, in a class of 33, there were 32 books brought to class and the teacher would say, I'm going to write one, two, mbaka 33. I'll mix them up 
And whoever takes number 33 does not get. Guess who used to get that? Me. So I'm not usually lucky. But I'm blessed. Hallelujah. When it comes to luck, I am not lucky. But blessed, I am. Have you ever had incidences in your life? And you wondered, why is it only me? There was a clip that we were going to watch together. But I just want us to explore a certain person in scripture who is not preached a lot about. In fact, most of the times he's mentioned in passing. And most of the time he's looked at not very positively. And if you read a lot of commentaries, uh, there are some very negative comments made about him. But today I want us to explore just a little bit, having an exposition around this person, and see what lessons can we learn. And what is it about his adversity? He was dealt a bad hand from birth. And what is it about him that we can learn from him? Because probably you have found yourself where he's at. And this is the account of someone called Esau. Now we find in Genesis 25, 21, 23, We are told now, Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her. Even before they were born, they were struggling in the womb. I don't know what they were telling each other because we we are told people don't talk in the womb. But but there was strife in in the womb. And we are told that Then when she inquired of the Lord, we are told, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Tell a neighbor disadvantaged. I mean, before Esau was born, it was prophesied. He is the older, but he'll serve the younger. I mean, really, if it's being dealt a bad hand, even before you are born. So if it's prophesied, you are the older one, but you serve the younger, what chance do you have? The moment it's already declared, you stand no chance or very low chance, even before you are, you're born. He was disadvantaged even before birth. How more can you be disadvantaged? You see, if you're born in certain places. Even before being born, you're already disadvantaged. Did you know that? Where medical care is not available, schools are not properly available, facilities are not available, funds are not available. Disadvantaged even before birth. So even before Esau was born, we see that he was disadvantaged. Then we find later on In the same passage of scripture, verse 29, we are told that now Jacob cooked a stew and Esau came in from the field and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew for I am weary. Therefore therefore his name was called Edom. And we are told that, but Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. Now let me ask you a question. When you are hungry and then someone tells you, for me to give you food, sell me your birthright. I don't know if you've ever starved here, those people here, uh, starvation. Now, did you know if you starved? Now, one time, when I was little, because I was very mischievous, um, I had committed one of the crimes among the many that I used to commit. I I repeat, your pastor used to commit serious home crimes. I, I have not always been this nice guy, you know. I have caused trouble in my mother's house and even in my grandmother's house. Now, it, it so happened, as they are giving stories, that my neighbors were bought very nice shoes for Christmas. And I was not bought. And we were in the village. In my green jealousy, now being very dark, you can't see me green with envy, but I sometimes would be, I actually stole the shoes. And I hid them in the school compound, which was very near us, inside a bush. And uh, the following day, the others wore shoes for Christmas, but this boy never wore them. And they started asking, where are the shoes? Has anyone seen the shoes? And of course, I was one of the people who was asked. Now, in Greek, that is, have you seen the shoes? And I innocently answered, of course, what is the children for answer? Children, the answer what is? 
I don't. Yes, that is a classic answer. All the children in the country, they all have the same answer. What is the answer? I don't know. I don't know. And no child knows, by the way. So when you ask your child a question, and they answer, I don't know, please understand, they don't, even when they know they don't know. And after a few days, uh, after several persuasions, uh, I finally went to pick the shoes. And I secretly brought them, and I was seen. And that is the day terror happened on me. I was dealt with from all angles. Jesus is good, I am still alive. This is evidence that Jesus saves. And let me tell you, and that day I remember I was being denied food. I've never had a longer night in my life. I didn't have a watch. Yeah, and I I went to bed and I really struggled because that night was the longest night. I tossed and I turned and I tossed and I turned and I didn't sleep. I don't know when I slept. But whenever I slept, whenever I would wake up in the night, it would really be tough on me. So you can imagine... You have Esau, who's very hungry, and he's been told to sell his birthright. I mean, really, he wants to self-preserve. Tell anybody he's advantaged. I mean, couldn't he ask his mother for food? Really? Could he check out on his dad and what he had been served? How, how alienated was Esau that he is hungry and he can only ask his brother? What was it? about being so disadvantaged that you can't even get food to eat. It's as though he lived a very solitary life. Disadvantaged. Tell anybody disadvantaged. You know, it's a shocking story. And then after that we find that Isaac blesses Jacob. You know? You know the story how it goes, isn't it? That is betrayal. Tell anybody disadvantaged. I mean, the mother and the son came together, isn't it? And they plotted against Esau, mother and son, his own mother. Let me tell you, friends, if your own mother betrays you, it's very painful. Now, I've never been betrayed, so I do not know how it feels to be betrayed by your mother. But you can imagine your own mother betraying who? You. She discusses with your brother and then betrays you. That is one of the worst betrayals. No wonder, maybe she even betrayed him over food. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Again, he's betrayed. That was from the mother. It's an abuse of trust. Until even his name, we are told, Edom means red. You know, sold birthright for red potage. Do you know what that was? Lentils, dengu. Can you imagine? Yani, you're being referred to with dengu as a name. And the one who sold his birthright for what? For lentils. On a serious note, honestly, you wouldn't have used the birthright for dengu. Nalof. Honestly, can you imagine how, 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 how embarrassing it is even to be referred like that? He's so disadvantaged. So disadvantaged. Same is the account of the lepers. The lepers that we read about, we, they have no names. Have you noticed? We are not told where they came from. In fact, they just happened to be there. There is no account of where they came from. They were so low they could not even be described with a name, even a parent's name. You remember Blind Bar Timaeus? He was the son of Timaeus. That was more high. These ones, they even have no name. In fact, it's like they just appear on the scene. Boom. They appeared. Then there were four lepers. They came from nowhere. They are going No, The only thing we are told is from there, they went somewhere. But where did they come from? Are, are we told? That, I mean, they were so low, they didn't even have names or titles. Or even mentioning their families. In fact, they are referred by their condition. You know, I don't know if you've ever been broke or if you've ever been in need. I have. And in those days, when you're really broke, you text someone and they know, ah, Benson wants a man. They won't pick. You know, I mean, things are so thick, but people know when they see your call, they know. Then they describe it by your condition. And that was the state of the lepers. They were described by their condition. Somebody cracked a joke and said that um, a certain man was so poor, 
that even the poor called him poor. So you can imagine how poor he was. You are so poor. In fact, the poor themselves call you what? So you can imagine the state. Just tell your neighbor disadvantaged. And let me tell you, friends, sometimes we find ourselves disadvantaged. Nothing is working our way. You start a project, it's not succeeding. You start planning something, it's not working. You plan a committee meeting, the committee collapses. And you keep wondering, how come everything is falling apart? And you feel very disadvantaged. As I was preparing for today's session, there's a clip I'd like us to watch for a few minutes. And I want us to listen to this story together because she speaking from a very disadvantaged position. And I want us to look at this together because as we look at our rising based on the word of God, we need sometimes to also see places people find themselves disadvantaged. If you think that your life is hard and you're giving up on that because you think your life is unfair, think again. I was 18 years old when I got married. I belonged to a very conservative family, a Baloch family, where good daughters never say no to their parents. My father wanted me to get married. And all I said was, if that makes you happy, I'll say yes. And of course, it was never a happy marriage. Just about after two years of getting married, about nine years ago, I met a car accident. Somehow my husband fell asleep and the car fell in the ditch. He managed to jump out, saved himself. I'm happy for him. But I stayed inside the car and I sustained a lot of injuries. The list is a bit long. Radius ulna of my right arm were fractured. The wrist was fractured. Shoulder bone and collarbone were fractured. My whole rib cage got fractured, and because of the rib cage injury, lungs and liver were badly injured. But that injury that changed me and my life completely as a person and my perception towards living my life was the spine injury. Three vertebra of my backbone were completely crushed, and I got paralyzed for the rest of my life. Many people came to rescue, they gave me CPR, they dragged me out of the car. And while they were dragging me out, I got the complete transaction of my spinal cord. Those two and a half months in the hospital were dreadful. I was at the verge of despair. One day, doctor came to me and he said, well, I heard that you wanted to be an artist, but you ended up being a housewife. I have a bad news for you. You won't be able to paint again. Next day, doctor came to me and said, your spine injury is so bad, you won't be able to walk again. I took a deep breath and I said, it's all right. Next day, doctor came to me and said, because of your spine injury and the fixation that you have in your back, you won't be able to give birth to a child again. That day, I was devastated. I still remember, I asked my mother, why me? And that is where I started to question my existence. Why am I even alive? And that is where I realized that the words have the power to heal the soul. My mother said to me, this too shall pass. God has a greater plan for you. I don't know what it is, but he surely has. That day I decided that I'm going to fight my fears. So I wrote down one by one all those fears and I decided that I'm going to overcome these fears one at a time. Do you know what was my biggest fear? Divorce. I couldn't stand this word. I was trying to cling on to this person who didn't want me anymore, but I said, no, I have to make it work. But the day I decided that this is nothing but my fear, I liberated myself by setting him free. And I made myself emotionally so strong that the day I got the news that he's getting married, I sent him a text that I'm so happy for you and I wish you all the best. 
And he knows that I pray for him today. Number two was, I won't be able to be a mother again. And that was quite devastating for me. But then I realized there are so many children in the world, all they want is acceptance. So there is no point of crying, just go and adopt one. And that's what I did. Two years later, I got this call from a very small city in Pakistan. I got a call and they said, are you Muniba Mazari? There is a boy, baby boy and would you like to adopt? And when I say yes, I could literally feel the labor pain. I said, yes, yes, I am going to adopt him. I am coming to take him home. So when you accept yourself the way you are, the world recognizes you. It all starts from within. We have this amazing fantasy about life. This is how things should work. This is my plan. It should go as per my plan. If that doesn't happen, we give up. I never wanted to be on the wheelchair. Never thought of being on the wheelchair. This life is a test and a trial and tests are trials are never supposed to be easy. So when you are expecting ease from life and life gives you lemons, then you make the lemonade and then do not blame life for that because you were expecting ease from a trial. Trials make you a stronger, better person. Life is a trial. Every time you realize that it is okay to be scared. It is okay to cry. Everything is okay, but giving up should not be an option. They always say that failure is not an option. Failure should be an option because when you fail, you get up and then you fail and then you get up and that keeps you going. There are so many people in the world who are dreaming to live a life that you are living right now. You have no idea. Embrace each and every breath that you are taking. Celebrate your life. Live it. Don't die before your death. Live your life fully. Accept yourself the way you are. Be kind to yourself. Real happiness lies in gratitude. So be grateful, be alive. And live every moment. years old doesn't choose her groom he sleeps when driving escapes she gets into that crisis and guess what he divorces her to anybody's advantage and many times when we find ourselves in that disadvantaged position many times many people stay there but I want you to notice something about us how and we find in Genesis 27 30 to 40, we find a very interesting account. 27 verse 32 said, And his father Isaac said to him, Who are you? Tell a neighbor desperate. We are finding a place of desperation, disadvantaged, and then we are finding desperation. And here he is, he's asked by his father, Who are you? So he said, I am your son, your firstborn, Esau. You can imagine your father sent you to go and get him some meat and you make some meal for him. You've come back and you made a meal. You're walking in and he's asked you, who are you? What do you mean, who are you? We agreed I'm going to get it for you. Desperation. Then Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, who? Where is the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate all of it. Before you came, and I have blessed him, and indeed he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceeding great cry and bitter cry, and said to his father, Bless me, me also, O my father. But he said, Your brother came with deceit, and has taken away your blessing. Remind your neighbor, disadvantaged. Tell them, desperate. And you are finding many times, when you are at a disadvantaged position, you most of the time find yourself in a desperate position. Disadvantage creates a momentum for desperation. And many times we miss the promise of God because we find ourselves in a space of desperation. Abraham had believed God for a son. 
he felt disadvantaged. And he said, will I give over my wealth and my property to my servants? And then his wife came up with a suggestion. And that's where Ishmael was born. We find desperation. And many times we fall into sin when we are at a place of disadvantage. And then we are at a place of desperation. And the enemy knows exactly what to do. And we miss the promise of God at the space of desperation. And we are finding he's very desperate. He's very desperate. Have you ever failed an interview? You go to the interview and you've prepared so hard and things are so thick. You didn't even have the money, but you borrowed anyway. And you got into that matter too and you went to the interview and you flop. And then you meet someone who was picked. When I was younger, I loved acting. And I went for a commercial. Uh, I, used to, I loved acting so much. So I used to do lots of theatre. And so I went for this commercial. I won't tell you which one. Uh, actually, it was Omo Pick a Box. And I went for this commercial and we did auditions. And I learned later I was number three, not even number two. Of course, there were very many of us. I didn't like the guy who won, but he was brilliant. And he did such an excellent work. And I was jealous. And I felt so bad because I was broke and I really wanted that commercial. And that's the last commercial I auditioned for. I was very discouraged. Actually, I felt like I was not good enough. Have you ever failed? I've gone for interviews and I've failed. And it's a terrible feeling. It's a terrible feeling, failing. And at that point, while you felt disadvantaged, now you also desperate. One time, after looking for a job for a while and not getting, I, had, I told God, dear God, if you do not give me a job today, then do not wake me up tomorrow morning. Tell your neighbor foolish prayers. You don't make such prayers with God. But in my foolishness, I went to sleep. Now, so when I woke up in the morning, I wanted to be sure whether I was in heaven. But I saw the little gray on my little roof and I saw my little walls with my friend. We were sharing a house. And I realized I was actually alive. And I was very angry with God. Tell a neighbor desperate. Remind them dis disadvantaged. Now tell them desperate. And I was very desperate for a job. And I think when God saw my foolishness, uh, because you don't give God ultimatums, God is God. Praise the Lord. We request God. We don't command God. I think he saw my foolishness. And so, uh, the following day, actually that day in the evening, actually, that day, I got a call and I got a, I got a job. And that was one of my first jobs ever. And, and we find that desperation kicks in. We find in, in Second Kings uh, about the leprous men. Now there are four leprous men at the entrance of the gate. Now you see, these people ask themselves a very good question. Now, there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they say to one another, where are we sitting here until we die? And we find that being leprous was a con as a condition was a desperate condition. When you have time, read Leviticus 13, about the law of leprosy. Now, when, you're, when you get leprosy, and it's clear you have it, you're declared unclean. You dwell alone. You live outside the camp and you must shout unclean, unclean when approaching people. In the New Testament, Luke 17, 11 to 19, as Jesus entered the village, then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. You must stand afar off and say unclean, unclean. You could not stay with the people. You were isolated. You lived outside the village, if there was a village. You lived outside the city. You could only come together with people your condition. The nature of things, friends, is that we coalesce together according to our condition. We coalesce together according to our conditions. We find comfort among people who are in the season we are in. Somebody said, misery loves company. And that is why you find that when people start abusing alcohol, they hang around people who abuse alcohol. 
When someone joins and in, starts wanting to do some investment, they'll find people who like doing what? Investing. If you, if you like, if you have a passion for praying and walking with God, you actually find yourself meeting people who have a passion for praying and walking with God. So the question to ask is, who do you find yourself coalescing with? Ask your neighbor, what kind of coalition do you create? For that speaks a lot about where you are. Just ask your neighbor, what kind of coalition do you create? Uh, People are laughing and some have refused to ask. I have seen you. You better ask your neighbor, what kind of coalition do you create? (laughs) And with who? (laughs) Remind your neighbor disadvantaged. Now remind them desperate. And we are finding that when you find yourself there, the next biggest question is, will you remain there? Now, many people who get health conditions that are depression-related are people who found themselves at the place of disadvantage and then were at a point of desperation and they stayed there. That becomes a health condition. They were at a place of disadvantage, then they found themselves at the point of desperation, and then they formed a coalition And in that coalition, they have a pity party. You know a pity party? Whoa, mimi ni kubaya. Eh, oh, life has happened, life has happened. It hit me very hard. Ask me. First of all, me, now he's now, so they start, it's a pity party on the troubles and, and and the terrors they're going through. And as they're going through that pity party, they all live there very discouraged. Because, at that point, depression can easily come. Because they are trapped in the disadvantaged position, and they are sitting on the seat of desperation. And it's a terrible place to stay. It's a terrible place to stay. And you are finding, you find yourself at the place of decision. Tell your neighbor decision. And we find that 36, 38, and as I said, is he not rightly named Jacob, for he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and now look, he has taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Hallelujah. Have you not reserved a blessing for me? A place of decision. Praise the Lord. We cannot stick at the place of disadvantage. We have no idea how we find ourselves there. And many times, it's not even your doing. Sometimes it's your doing, but most of the time, it has nothing to do with what you have done. And when you find yourself in a place of desperation, you have a need that is not being met, and it's frustrating. And so you're desperate. But you are ushered into the place of decision. And he asked his father a very important question. Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Then Isaac answered and said to Esau, Indeed, I have made him your master, and all his brethren I have given to him as servants. With grain and wine I have sustained him. What shall I do now for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me. Me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Tell your neighbor, decision. Remind them, disadvantaged. Remind them what? Next is desperation. Now tell them decision. And we are finding he decides to persist. Praise the Lord. He decides to do what? To persist. I have found that in life, some of the most successful people are not the most brilliant people, shockingly. Are not necessarily the most gifted people, amazingly. Are not the most endowed people, shockingly. They are the persistent people. Praise the Lord. They make up their mind to be persistent. They make up their mind, they are not giving up. They make up their mind, I don't know what you're talking about, but I'm going to persist. I met a man one time in university, and this man impressed me. This man told me when he did his school exams, he got a very low grade, that the best he could do was a certificate. Tell a neighbor certificate. And so he did a certificate and went to work in agriculture. 
because he was, it was in agriculture actually, in one of the colleges up country. Imagine he then, after some few years, went back to school and did a diploma. Tell me about diploma. And then he worked a little. He got married with that diploma. But then he went back again and did a bachelor's degree. And then he kept working. And then he went back and did a master's degree. And then he kept working. He went back and did a PhD. And I hear right now he's a very senior professor in all the top universities. He was not the straight A student in his form four class. He had one quality, persistence. He made a decision not to stay at the place of disadvantage, not to be depressed at the place of desperation, but he came to a place of decision. Praise the Lord. And many times the differentiator is not the gifting. In fact, it's not even the anointing in someone's life. It's the ability to say, yes, I was disadvantaged. Yes, I have been desperate, but I refuse to stay here. I am making a decision. Praise the Lord. And that is what differentiates great people. That is what differentiates successful people and the non-successful people. That is why a business that was started today One will thrive, one will die, because one will persist, and one will look at the disadvantage. They'll actually tell you, you know, us, we are hustlers. Good morning, why? Imagine someone asking you, why? Tell me, how are you doing to Najikaza? You know, Kenyan Kenyan responses. Kazi Nandilaje to Najaribu. You know, it, 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 it's always on this other side. Nimulima, we are trying. Even when success has come, someone doesn't say, I glorify God for what he has done. Decision. He decided to persist. Second King 7.45 If we say we will enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit there, here we die also. Let me tell you something, friends. Did you know that this is very sad? That if you make the decision, God will come through for you. But if you don't, one of the things we are all assured of is death, isn't it? If Christ tarries. And so they discovered for themselves, we shall live. They said, if they keep us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall only die. And they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. They did arise. Hallelujah. And let me tell you, friends, the place of arising, it's premised at the place of decision. You have to simply make up your mind. Yesterday, our pre- one of our preachers preached a very powerful message. His name is Mark Jenga. Now, Mark Jenga today was our service leader. And told us something about worry. One of the things he taught us, among the many good things he taught, was about worry. And I took notes. I like taking notes when someone is preaching. And he told us about worry that 40% of what we worry about never happens. Tell anybody it never happens. He also told us, and 30% of what you worry about is based on the past decisions. Can you change that? So imagine 70% is what? Now, 12% is about criticism by some people who may be having inferiority issues or confidence issues. Can you change them? And then 10% is related to health, and it gets worse when you keep worrying about it. So only 8% is legitimate. So 92% of the things you worry about, you cannot change. So when you come to the place of decision, If you don't make that decision, you're not making yourself better. Jesus actually said, Matthew 6.25, he said, do not worry. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit? of his teacher. I can testify about this scripture here that it has happened in my life. I planted, I have a tree. One of the trees produced one apple. Then there's some bird called Modo. Now I don't know the name of Modo in English. The one with a long beak. So she, he came with a wife. And they seriously attacked my poor apple. And there was only one. 
One, fast food. And you see, that's for priests. And so I was w- wanted to thoroughly enjoy it until they appeared with the wife. And so when I looked through the window, I saw him and the wife, and they were thoroughly enjoying the apple. God is feeding them according to this scripture. So, so I'm thinking of creating a cage so that mother and the wife do not resurface. But their beak is very long. So remind your neighbor disadvantaged. And remind them the next one is what? Desperate. Tell them desperate. Tell them decision. Now I want us to conclude with one more. Tell them deliverance. Now remind them disadvantaged, desperate, decision, deliverance. Now deliverance is a place we all want to get to. But wait a minute, friends, you don't get to deliverance. It's a journey. And you mostly get to deliverance from the place of decision. Genesis 27, 39 tells us, Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth. Now that's a blessing. And of the dew of heaven from above. Now that's a blessing. But then listen to this. By your sword you shall live. And you shall serve your brother. And it shall come to pass. Tell your neighbor when you become restless. That you shall break his yoke. From your neck. Deliverance comes when you become restless. Many people long to be delivered, but they are not restless. Many people long for a breakthrough, but they are not restless. They are not uncomfortable. And because of that, the breakthrough doesn't come. You see, there has to be a level of discomfort at the place and point of deliverance. We have to reach a point of saying, enough is enough, I cannot take this anymore. For the lepers we find, we are told very very clearly that their deliverance came because the Lord caused victory for them. For the Lord had caused the army of the Assyrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses. God is able to cause that for your enemy. But for you to get there, you must come to the place of decision. Saying, I cannot take this anymore. I cannot take it anymore. You have to reach that point. And if you don't reach there, then don't wait for deliverance. Remind your neighbor disadvantaged. Remind them desperate. Tell them about the decision. Remind them about deliverance. When you become restless, you shall break the yoke from your neck. The Lord shall cause victory. Arise with eyes of faith. Believe in the unbelievable because God is able. But you have to make that decision. And no one can do that for you. In closing, I'll make two comments for you. Did Esau really break the yoke? Scripture records, 2 Kings 8, verses 20. In his days, Adam revolted against Judah's authority and made a king over themselves. They broke the yoke. Praise the Lord. Second Chronicles 21, 8 10. In his days, Edom revolted against Judah's authority and made a king over themselves. So Jehoram went out with his officers and all his chariots with them. And he rose by night and attacked the Edomites who had surrounded him and the captains of the chariots. That's Edom has been in revolt against Judah. Judah's authority this day. At that time, Libna revolted against his rule because he had forsaken the Lord God of his fathers. Second Chronicles 28, 16, 17. At the same time, King Ahaz sent to the kings of Assyria to help him. For again, the Edomites had come and attacked Judah and carried away captives. You do not have to always be captive. We are to hold every thought captive. So that thought, that way of the enemy, does not always have to hold you captive. You can also hold it captive. That place of disadvantage always, you can say, I'm refusing to get there again. And you can say from today, henceforth, I'm walking boldly, saying I've made a decision. I'm revolting against this habit. Sometimes people are so, cap- are so captured by a habit, they say, I cannot overcome it. When you hear someone saying that, the issue is not the habit. Mm-mm. They are comfortable at the place of disadvantage and desperation. And as long as they're in that place of comfort, in that disadvantage and desperation, you can never get them out. And that's when we go down on your knees and we pray for them. If you have a brother who is an addict, 
Go down on your knees. That the Holy Spirit may reveal to them that where they are so comfortable at is a place of bondage. They should come to a place of making a decision and then they'll break the yoke and they'll get the deliverance. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for you are the word of life. You are the giver of life and you are the giver of hope. How I pray, Almighty God, that you will help us. Yes, some of us may have found ourselves at a place of disadvantage. And we may have remained there. And some of us may have found ourselves after that at the place of desperation. And we were stuck at that place. A place, a place of desperation. And the enemy has been taking advantage of us. But today, making a decision. Saying, I'm not going to stay there anymore. And King of glory, I pray for deliverance. That I may arise. And each one of us may arise. You're here, and you're saying, I want to arise. I want to come out of this pity party. I want to make a decision today. I want to break the yoke and find my deliverance. With all eyes closed, just raise your hand wherever you are. I just want to pray with you. Because the Lord is saying something tonight. He wants to set us free. Just put up your hand. Now for every hand that is up, say this after me, dear Jesus. I thank you because you died for me on the cross. You know my place of disadvantage. I may not be able to change it. You know the point of desperation. And how the enemy may have taken advantage. But today I'm making a decision. To stand out. To confront this issue that you know so well, oh my Lord. And I'm speaking today. You're taking me to my point of deliverance. You're taking me to my point of deliverance. You're taking me to my point of deliverance. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for setting me free. I refuse to be comfortable at disadvantage and desperation. I'm ready to take the discomfort of the decision. Holy Spirit, enable me. Empower me. Help me to arise. In your precious name. Amen. We put down your hand. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've spoken tonight and you've helped us to arise and to be set free. In Jesus' name we pray. All God people say, Amen.